It was the discipline and the training I learned so that I carried that through my life, even as I had injuries and setbacks and so forth. Uh, when that crucial moment came, the martial arts training had prepared me. Hello, everyone. It's episode 92 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Sabanim Scott Pribble. My name's Jeremy Lesniak, and I founded Whistlekick, but I'm also your host here for Martial Arts Radio. Whistlekick, I'm very proud to say, makes the world's best sparring gear and some really great apparel and accessories, all for those of you involved in the traditional martial arts. Thank you to the returning listeners, and hello and welcome to those of you checking us out for the very first time. If you're not familiar with our products, you should take a look at what we make. We have quite a few different styles of hats, fitted ball caps, winter hats, and new styles are always on the way. Check them out and buy at whistlekick.com. Now, if you want to see the show notes, those are on another website, and that's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. While you're over there, get on the newsletter list. We offer special content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. We only email you a few times a month, we never sell your information, and sometimes we mail out a pretty generous coupon. Now on episode 92, we're joined by a man with an incredible story. Zamanim Scott Pribble started martial arts training as a late teenager and really took to it. He credits his professional success to the lessons he learned in the martial arts, and also his survival of an incident that literally no other person is known to have survived. He's an incredible man and tells some amazing stories. Enjoy. Summon and Pribble, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Well, good morning, Jeremy. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you, sir? Well, I'm very well on a Monday morning. <laughs> it is a Monday morning, and it's earlier than we usually do interviews here from from headquarters, but of course, want, really wanted to get you on the show, and this was the time slot that Worked for both of us, so I'm, I appreciate your jumping on the phone early in the morning. Well, and, it's a uh, pleasure to be with you, sir. I appreciate it very much. Oh, it's going to be fun. We'll have a good time. So let's jump in. Let's start it the way we always start it. Of course, if you're on the show, you're a martial artist. How did you get started in the martial arts? Well, I'm a little bit older than you, I suspect. I'm 61 years old, but back in the early 70s, over 40 years ago, I saw two movies, one of which was Billy Jack and the other was Enter the Dragon with Bruce Lee. And I really got uh, hooked on martial arts and um, got the bug, so to speak. And then as I began my college years in 1973, as I was driving to school one day, I happened upon a Taekwondo school that had just opened in Green Bay a couple months before. And... Uh, I stopped back on my way after college, looked into it, and learned enough about it to say, this is what I'm going to do. And so what was it that you learned? What was it that, that felt compelling to you to, to drag you through the doors that first time? When I first saw those two movies, again, Billy Jack and Enter the Dragon, what I noticed beyond the uh, impressiveness of the uh, arts that were represented by both Billy Jack and uh, Bruce Lee's character and how dynamic what they did was, was I sensed a self, self I'll rephrase it, a sense of self-confidence both those actors had in their characters. And I knew that I needed that degree of self-confidence. I was 18 years old at the time. And I thought, well, maybe this would be a good vehicle for me to achieve that or to realize that. And sure enough, that's what happened. After about two months, my self-confidence and my self-esteem began to increase dramatically as I began to learn Taekwondo and a bit of Karate. And uh, it's been a process since where my natural personality, which is a type A, came through by virtue of my involvement with martial arts. So it sounds like we're getting a little bit of a contrast, your, your, your post or intra martial arts life. Very what much. What were so. you like? Okay. What were you like as a, as a teenager? If you, you know, I'm, I'm sensing you didn't have that self-confidence, but you were cognizant that you were lacking that. 
Yes, I would describe myself as being non-assertive or even at times timid during most of my childhood, adolescence, and teenage years. And I knew that there was something within me that was much stronger, for lack of a better word, but I didn't have the right mechanism or vehicle to let that part out, but I always sensed it was there. So when I saw those movies and just had that aha moment that if I can find a way to do that, it's going to help me understand myself better. And then happening upon this Taekwondo school, and later there was a second, but that's all we had in Green Bay, Wisconsin at that time were two Taekwondo schools uh, 43 years ago. So I got involved, and it was hard, and it was difficult. I was a fairly good athlete in high school, but the types of uh, movements in particularly utilizing muscles I had never used before in kicking particular just brought me to a new level. I began to push myself and push myself, and I had a fantastic uh, master instructor, uh, Grandmaster Young Sam Kim, who moved all of us in that direction by example, and he was a pretty hard instructor, and I'm very grateful for the discipline and the toughness that he conveyed. Sounds like you found martial arts at the right time in your life. You know, that's exactly the way it worked out. And in the book I wrote, Miracle Man Beating the Odds, Cheating Death, I described that experience that whenever I've had an inkling, a notion or a gut feel that I needed to move in a certain direction for some end result, even though I didn't know what the end result necessarily would be, the vehicle would show up. So it goes back to that old concept of when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Nothing personifies that more in my life than my introduction to Grandmaster Kim and Taekwondo. Wow. Certainly a, a fortuitous chain of events. Yes. And I know we're going to hear more about how that's impacted your life as we move on. But now it's story time, and I'd like you to take a few minutes and tell us your best martial arts story. Well, I think the best story that I have is when I began training in martial arts, I would go to tournaments, and I was normally a couple months behind the people in my group, whatever belt ranking we happened to be, and I did fair at best in tournaments, and I wanted to improve upon that. My body weight was about 170 pounds. And in the Korean martial arts, 166 and above was considered a heavyweight. So I was always sparring against people that were much bigger because I was barely over the limit. So after doing fair for the better part of a year, I decided I needed to develop my upper body strength because I noticed that even though some of these people I competed with uh, weighed more and could kick better, they didn't have much upper body strength. So I began weightlifting. And I didn't really know much about that either, but I did notice I got stronger in my upper body development, and I was able to compete uh, in the ring better in tournaments, barring just point uh, tournaments. We didn't have mixed martial arts at that time. And ultimately, when breaking was allowed to be into the tournaments, which was not that way in the early 70s, but later on it was an event, I became very good at breaking bricks five boards. I had four different techniques. I could break five pine boards and I could do a hammer strike and get three concrete blocks. And this is all when I was probably 20 or 21. So my confidence just soared. And I'll never forget those moments because it really helped transform me as an individual and uh, make me a much better person and a much stronger person internally. Hmm. So let's pretend that you never found martial arts, that, you know, there wasn't Taekwondo or Green, in Green Bay or, you know, you didn't happen to take that route for whatever reason. You never stumbled on it. What do you think your life now would look like without your martial arts training? I think that I would not. I was very fortunate. I've got to back that up to have reached some very good career goals Um, shortly after my training with martial arts, 1978 to be specific, I became a corporate executive at age um, 
23 and then at 25 I got a big promotion with a large firm in our area on a national level and had I not had the discipline that I gained through Taekwondo I would not have even attempted to make those career endeavors at age 23 and 25 I would have been very reluctant so as a result I think I would have had a much more uh, limited role from a career standpoint and I've been very, very fortunate to receive more than 50 formal awards in my career for achievement. A uh, beautiful letter from Ronald Reagan, another one from my local congressman, uh, strictly from a business standpoint. And then I've got about 20 trophies and plaques and so forth from uh, my martial arts endeavors and uh, weightlifting as well. So it just helped me evolve as a human being to be much more disciplined much stronger internally, and subsequently that lets the real self out. Wow. So one of the things that I'm struck by is what seems to be such a rapid progression. You know, here you start in your, did you say your late teens or or 20 with your martial arts training? I started uh, the fall of 1973, September, so I was uh, 18, four months away from my 19th birthday, yes. Okay. So here, you know, we're just about four years from that point, you become an executive, something that very few people in their early 20s achieve. Yes. And clearly that wasn't a fluke. That was a a career trajectory that it sounds like all of that launched from your joining martial arts. It sure did, because the people that I was competing with for those positions at age 23 and 25, as you can imagine, had a lot more experience than I did and came from more prestigious universities. I had a bachelor's degree and most of them had master's degrees. And uh, I had to fight hard to get the jobs. And that's really what did it. I just fought harder than the other people um, fighting in a, in a polite business sense, not in a, in a, uh, a sparring match type sense. Right. Right, But that's that what I really for... had to do. I had to figure out a way that how am I going to beat these opponents because they're better equipped. Just like when I said before, I had to figure out a way to do better in tournaments because I wasn't doing very well. And I found that weightlifting for my upper body gave me strength uh, in that part, which helped me do much better. And then when it came to breaking as an event, well, that's where I excelled. That was my best event. So that combination of things, and you hit it right on the head, they evolved very, very quickly. But when they did, uh, it really transformed me. You seem like a very goal-oriented person that once you decide you want something, it's it's going to happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Fantastic. And Taekwondo, what I loved about it, and martial arts in general, I think they're all similar. You have promotion tests, or we did every three months, And we knew when the next one was going to be. We knew what we had to learn. And we knew how hard we had to train. We knew when the next tournament was going to come. We knew all these things well in advance when we were going to give a demonstration. So as a result, as a group of people in our dojang, we trained hard. And we were well prepared. And Grandmaster Kim made sure we were prepared. And it was not easy back then because uh, I would call it blood and guts Taekwondo or blood and guts karate because we did not wear any pads of any sort and even though it was supposed to be light contact it often was a lot more than that and uh, we got into some scuffles and we had to train hard and there were broken bones and I've had 10 or 12 surgeries as a result but we just get back up and you keep going and that was Grandmaster Kim's theory you just keep going and you build that internal strength which the Koreans call ki and I believe the Japanese use the same term, key, for the internal yes. energy. Mm-hmm. So that I, I think we're getting quite the the picture of you, and and that's always fun for me as the host to to see the path that oh, people take you. and see how everyone's path is different. But yet, f- for most of us, those differences are so small. I mean, we all tend to find martial arts maybe we weren't seeking it out for the same reasons that you were, but at some point, maybe it's only in retrospect, we realized that that confidence piece was so huge 
to the formation of our character at whatever point in our lives we find martial arts. So I think it's it's fun to see such a uh, tangible non-martial arts result. Yes, and that's from really your martial arts career. Yeah, I don't mean to interrupt you. I'm sorry, but you are no, have hit on a, a key topic. The discipline you learn in martial arts, especially when you're young, 18 years old. At that point, I was probably the youngest student in the school. Most were in the early to mid 20s, but it carries through life. Um, and I hadn't thought about this until I was injured at age 53 eight years ago. The fundamental principles that build your internal self carry through, and you only get that through martial arts training, uh, in my experience. So they carry you through whatever you do in your career, whatever you do in your personal life, family life, um, as you meet other challenges, as you grow and develop and going through the surgeries from broken bones to knees and shoulders and all that type of stuff, your character builds. And it's a very unique way of character. And I would always refer to it as my form of military training because I was not in the armed services, but within Taekwondo and the, again, the Korean judges who I'm so grateful to for teaching me the discipline required and to get up no matter what you, you just get up and you keep going a uh, tremendous lesson for life. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. We have a saying here on the show or I, I have a saying that comes out often in the episodes that I believe martial arts is the only thing that can leave someone with benefits throughout their life in a very short period of time. You know, three months, six months, a year as a young child mm -hmm. can give people tools that last them the rest of their life. And you don't find that in, so in soccer or basketball or Absolutely whatnot. correct. I used to be a pretty good basketball player, and I knew how to play the game. But internally, it, it really I was in good physical condition, but um, beyond that, it, it didn't really have an impact. So in your case, how long do you think it took you before you really sensed that your inner self was transforming into something stronger? You know, I'm not the best example of that because I literally do not remember a time in my life before martial arts. Hmm. I, st I started just beyond four. Oh, wow. And, and so I, I, don't, I don't remember. Um, I can theorize what my life was before. I can theorize what it would look like after. And that's kind of why uh, I personally enjoy the question, what do you think your life would look like without martial arts? Because I, I, I genuinely don't know. Mm -hmm. so. And in my case, I can tell you the lack of discipline and perseverance would not be there because those two, and then the indomitable spirit, uh, one of the four tenets of Taekwondo really came into play when I had this uh, life-threatening injury in 2008, which very few people survive from, and I've been able to make a little bit of a comeback. And I never really attributed that to much of anything other than my physical body. I had very low body fat percentage, specifically around my heart. So the surgeons in the middle of the night could do this emergency procedure on my aorta. And uh, later, it, it took seven years to understand personally, how did I survive that? I understand the physiological aspects from talking with the surgeons. And I did a lot of research, went to Mayo Clinic, did a lot of things to try to get this um, within my wheelhouse, so to speak, so I understood it. But what it really came down to at the end of the day, in March of last year, it came to me that, you know, that indomitable spirit tenant, and I went back and looked it up in general, Choi Hung He's book, which I have on my desk, that one tenant is what I believe carried me through that surgery and allowed me to survive and then come back, and then the perseverance and the discipline kept me getting up every day and doing the rehab that I did, although it was incredibly limited. I couldn't do much at all. But sure, I did. So we're, I came back. And we're glad you did. Thank you. Because now you're on the show and, and, and now you get to share your story. But let, let's go back. Our, our next question generally is about around a low point in your life. And I think that, you know, I, I've got a little bit of context because you and I have spoken. We, we've exchanged some emails and this is part of why I wanted to have you on the show. 
But let's go back and talk about that life-threatening surgery that you had that statistically you shouldn't have made it through. Give the audience some context for, for what happened and how impactful this was. Sure. On January 27th of 2008, at the age of 53, late at night, I was uh, going back to bed and I had an extreme sudden pain underneath my jaw. And it was extremely sharp and hard. Two days before, I had run five miles, so I was tempted to think that maybe I had twisted something in my body somehow that prompted this to happen because I was not having the symptoms of a heart attack. I didn't have any numbness in my upper body, no chest pain, none of that, just something under my jaw. So my wife and I waited at home for about an hour and a half, and now we're getting close to midnight when this is uh, evolving. And finally, my wife insisted that I contact my regular doctor's hotline because I was going to go back to bed. I took a couple of Tylenol, the pain subsided a little bit, and I thought, well, I'll go back to bed. What I did not know is that my aorta had dissected, and the odds of somebody surviving that are exactly one out of a million. Um, And that's a statistical fact on Wikipedia if they have not incurred stroke, brain damage, or paralysis. Only one in one million people who need emergency aortic dissection surgery will come out as I did. And uh, at any rate, went to one hospital. They diagnosed it right away. Thank God there was no one in the hospital so they could treat me specifically. Uh, Good news, bad news. They knew what the problem was. They found it right away. But the hospital was not equipped to do the surgery. So they had to prep me for surgery and then send me across town to another hospital that was able to do it. And by this time, close to three hours had elapsed. And most people that have this injury are dead within three hours, four hours at best. And I still was alive, although prepped for surgery. And uh, I had a number of events that occurred that I cannot fathom how they occurred, but they did. But I survived the surgery. Uh, I was in intensive care for four days. I have very little memory of that. Uh, for four days, I was in intermediate care. There was a, an artificial valve put into my heart. I have an artificial aorta. And unfortunately, I have a residual aortic dissection in my abdomen. It's called a residual dissection. And that one is still there. I'm having another CAT scan a week from today at this time, ironically. And that's monitored, monitored, excuse me, by medication. So the long and short of it is the odds of me surviving and then making a little comeback, which my book is about, Miracle Man, Beating the Odds, Cheating Death, probably one in 10 to 30, 50 million. Nobody knows, and I've been to Mayo Clinic, and I'm part of the John Ritter Foundation. Ooh, John Ritter died from that same injury. Um, They've been studying my DNA since August of 2015, and they still can't find what caused it, and more importantly, how did I survive and come back? And I believe, with all my heart, I'm absolutely convinced it was the discipline and the training I learned so that I carried that through my life, even as I had injuries and setbacks and so forth. Uh, When that crucial moment came, the martial arts training had prepared me to deal with that at a a different level, so to speak, rather than conscious. And I came through it. It took a long time to rehabilitate, seven years, but I kept doing the same stuff that Grandmaster Kim used to teach me. Wow. Now, this to me, this is just a a mind-blowing story, you know, and we've had several guests on the show who have cheated death. Mm-hmm. On, uh, of their own accord. And I'm not, I don't want to compare in the sense that any one person surviving something that statistically should have killed them or, or paralyzed them or, or something similar. Right. Um, you know, no, no one story is better than another or more important, but I think that just statistically um, you're probably the one person that has survived this set of circumstances I don't to me, want, that's just fascinating. Yeah, you make a good point, Jeremy, and I don't want to sound narcissistic um, because it isn't something I'm particularly proud of, to be honest with you. It just kind of happened. But so far, 
going to Mayo Clinic, being part of the John Ritter Foundation in Houston, Texas, their medical center, we haven't found anybody that survived and made a comeback like I did with the severity of the dissection and the amount of blood I lost. It took 25 pints to uh, keep me alive, and there was a four-minute wow. window. Once my body temperature is put into a cooling blanket, when my heart is stopped, there's a temperature threshold of 60 degrees, and once your body gets to that point and the heart is on a cardiopulmonary machine, there's 30 minutes for the surgeon to put in a new aorta as well as that prosthetic valve, which is made of carbon steel, and he did it in 26. And we just haven't found anyone who's been through that and then able to do some kind of activity, nothing like what I used to do. But if you look at my book, you'll see photographs that suggest I'm still somewhat active. Fabulous and just absolutely fascinating to me. And of course, for anyone that wants to check out, we'll have links to everything we're talking about, the book, some photos and whatnot over at the show notes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And we'll make sure we get you links where you can check out the book and make a purchase if that interests you. And hopefully it does because, you know, we're only scratching the surface here. You know, this is just us having a relatively quick chat versus a book, right? I mean, you, you go yes. into all this stuff. So. I go into great detail. I talk about my introduction as we did before, uh, Jeremy, about getting involved with Taekwondo and the lessons that I learned, which at first purely seemed to be physical, which was good. I needed that. But then the deeper inner strength and the inner development of character that I don't know that I had a full appreciation for uh, until this incident happened, those are the intrinsic or the salient benefits a person gets from martial arts training, that if they continue throughout their life, it is a way of life. It isn't just something you do when you're young. Keep doing it. Regardless of how proficient a person is, don't stop. And we've certainly had that advice from plenty of others, uh, both people that stopped for a time and, and those that have continued training throughout. Now, it's clear you've mentioned a couple times the influence that your original instructor, Grandmaster Kim, had not just on you as a youth, but, you know, setting you on this path. And clearly he, you know, changed your life. And, and I think we could even indirectly say saved your life. Yes. No Was course. there anyone else? If we were to take him out of the mix... Who else would you say if, if you were to pick someone that had a strong influence on your martial arts career? Well, um, when I got into it originally, all we had were the two Taekwondo schools here in Green Bay. There was nothing else. And one of them uh, taught a little bit of karate, and that was good. It blended well. But you had on your show a gentleman that I followed for many, many years, Bill Wallace. And yeah. Byung Yu, who was a Korean stylist, also used to be in Professional Karate Magazine. And I used to follow Fred Wren. Uh, Bruce Lee was the obvious one, but I found a lot of other people that I could relate to to some degree a little bit better. Alan Steen, Jeff Smith, uh, Joe Lewis, people like that, because their style was something that I felt I could emulate. I never got to that level. I was more regional from Chicago to Minneapolis and in the state of Wisconsin, Milwaukee area. That's where I would compete in tournaments. But those gentlemen that I mentioned, I would read about in every publication, black belt, official karate, everything. And I would digest that and consume it voraciously because I'd learned so much. Yeah, I mean, just absolutely wonderful people that you've mentioned. You know, of course, we've had a few on the show. We've had others that we've talked to, and, you know, they're they're still out there. We're still trying to get them on the show, and then, of course, some of them have passed on, and we won't get a chance to talk to them. But all of them incredible martial artists in their own right, and I think the influence from some of them at that time you know, we're never going to see that again. I don't know if you, if you would agree. Personally, I don't think we're ever going to see another Bill Wallace or another Joe Lewis. And it's the hard influence to imagine. That... You know, I, I don't see it. The, I don't know if you're into the UFC or mixed martial arts. I watch it on occasion, but I don't really follow it. 
but the degree of expertise that Bill Wallace and Joe Lewis had in performing uh, the precision with which they delivered their kicks, punches, blocks, etc. And especially Bill Wallace had with the injuries that he had uh, limiting the use of his uh, right leg to zero. No, I don't think we're going to see it. It was a magic era, and I doubt that we'll ever see it again. And the the cultural influence, you know, with movies and everything. And, and I do follow UFC a, a little bit, and it's interesting that you bring that up because I wonder if, you know, we'll look back from now, you know, 20 years from now, did Ronda Rousey have that kind of impact? Because she's certainly been the one to have the most cultural impact yeah. with any of, any of the fighters out of the UFC. That's a good question. Uh, I don't know. I, I hadn't thought about this until just now. But this morning I got up and looked uh, on the Internet at Jun Ri and at General Choi Hong Hee, both members of Taekwondo and instrumental in bringing Taekwondo throughout the world, and specifically Mr. Ri through uh, the United States. And I do that quite a bit. I look up people from the 70s and the 60s that I uh, was exposed to and you look at the brilliance that those people had at that time. And the other ones since are still very, very, very good, no question. But that 1968 to 1976 or 8 era, that was something very, very special. Yeah, without a doubt. And June Rhee is on the short list for people that I would you know, die to have on the show. And we have reached out, haven't heard anything back. Of course, he's... Uh, in the latter stages of his life, and I'm sure is very specific with what he spends his time on. But if anybody out there has a way of making that introduction, please, I would owe you big time. That would be a lot of fun. You know, I mentioned the congressman who sent me a real nice letter and invited me to be part of a Great Lakes Export Conference back in 1982 or three when I was 27 or 28. That was a big deal for me from a career standpoint. But his instructor in Washington, D.C. was June Rhee. He taught a number of congressmen and uh, senators. Yeah. Yeah, he was very active uh, politically, um, you know, kind of at a, a subtle level. Yes. Um, you know, I, I, I keep finding all these references to people that he taught and things that he had some say over in the background, things that, that maybe weren't quite as outward and fascinating. I mean, just very much, very fascinating, man. So if you could train with someone that you haven't, you know, and, and you could, we could say that now, you know, with, with where you were at in your life or, or perhaps back in your prime, we'll, we'll open it up. We'll give you a time machine. They can be alive or dead. Who would you want to train with? Well, I mentioned a number of people, which would be a real treat to do it. But also uh, Tadashi Yamashita, who was a Shito Ryu uh, master, as I recall. I would love to learn Japanese karate more. I didn't get much exposure. I got a little bit. But he was someone that always impressed me as well. Or uh, Hidetaka Nakayama Shotokan. Uh, I really liked the way he would perform when I would get a chance to see him, which was pretty rare. Uh, Byung Yu, I really liked as well. Um, Americans, Bill Wallace was in his own league. Amazing. Joe Lewis, same thing. So I've named four or five right there. That boy would be the thrill of a lifetime to train with those guys. Yeah. Yeah. All, all incredible. And of course, uh, Bill Wallace is still very active in presenting seminars and, um, you know, if anyone gets the chance to, to work with him, it's, you know, it's not too often you get to work with a legend with someone who yes. is recognized for their contributions and they're still alive. Yeah. And of course he is one of those people. So I, I think everyone should, should try to make the effort if you have that opportunity. When I listened to your uh, interview with him, it didn't sound like it was very long ago and he must be in incredible condition and be able to do the Chinese splits the way he could and probably still can. His he, testament- he's, I'm sorry. He's still incredibly flexible. Yeah, that episode, uh, episode 14, and we'll link it from the show notes here, was done back in June uh, in advance of a seminar that we put on with him here in Vermont back in August of 2015. And he is, 
I like to say he is a better martial artist now at age 70 than the majority of us have or ever would be in our lifetime. Hmm. That's um, amazing. I, that is he incredible. He continues to work very hard and, you know, can still put his foot anywhere on your body at a moment's notice. And, you know, he, he's lost a little bit of speed. He, he'll admit that, but very few people are, are going to be able to block him even now. And when we talk about the lifelong commitment to martial arts, uh, he personifies it. Master Ree does as well. Um, sure. Obviously, he's 83 or so, but for Bill Waltz at age 70 to do the things he does, uh, literally amazing. Yeah. There are no words. I can't. Incredible is not strong enough. No, no. He's he's still incredibly charismatic and genuinely enjoys what he's doing. And I think that that's, that's the key is that he found the thing that he is best at in the world and has lived it. And I think that yes. most people don't get the chance. Most people don't try enough things to find the thing that they're best at. And he mentioned that in your interview, and I thought that was extremely interesting, that everything kind of takes second place when you find that thing. And you're right on. I hear you loud and clear. And he found it, and no disrespect to his family or anything else that he's done, but that has been his guiding uh, light, so to speak. He's done yeah. it so well. He's influenced and taught so many people. Um and to come off the injuries he did to only use his left foot and be so incredibly good. I mean, that's, there just are no words that I can think of to describe someone who has done that. Right. Right. Well, it's, it's, you know, certainly the end result wouldn't have been anywhere similar, but you know, that same indomitable spirit, you know, those aren't necessarily the words that he would use. He, not having not been a Taekwondo practitioner, Mm -hmm. But, you know, just as, as your challenge was to overcome your body trying to end your life yeah. and, and fail, you know, his body was failing as well. And he said, well, forget this. I'm, I'm going to find a way forward. And he did mm -hmm. uh, just, to, just as you did. And I find those stories very, very motivating, very inspiring to see that, you know, th there's... There are so many people, so many places in the world that like to tell us, you know, your life is over, this is over, it's it's all falling apart. And yet wherever we have those condemnations, there's always someone that rises up through it and proves that, no, that death sentence, that um, curse, whatever it is, there's always a way out of it. Yeah, and it's interesting that you mentioned that because when I was in the hospital and I went from intensive care to intermediate care, there was a little device that was given to me to blow oxygen, air, to get my lungs to work again. And mm -hmm. the scale was maybe three inches, uh, one to four, but with a very narrow band. And I could not get to one. And I felt like a complete wimp. You know, I thought, my God, here I used to break boards and... and fairly uh, powerful movements and I can't blow this little ball one inch and they wanted me to get it to two inches before they released me and I just couldn't do it and when I got home uh, to walk 20 feet with assistance was a big deal they come back to recovery from this is uh, probably two years just to be able to walk and talk again normally and then I began to get back into moving my body the way that I used to, or did, try to anyway, I should say. I never got there to that degree. But there was something that continued to motivate me to try. And I would get slowly better and better. And now I just refer to it as my rehab. It's a work in progress, and it always will be. And I think that's a great attitude for it. You know, it's we're all on our path wherever we are, and, and there's always something in front of us to to challenge and I, I think it's incredibly admirable that admirable that you're moving forward, continuing to move forward from this. I mean just so many people would not. Well thank you. And I wish I could say that was a conscious thought, Jeremy, but in the first five years ago, something propelled me to even want to try because it would have been so easy to quit. And 
know, I didn't make a conscious decision to say, today I'm going to go out and conquer this. There was something within me that was moving me. And that's why I say it took several years for me to realize it's this notion of having an indomitable spirit or the internal strength called key. That was that um, causal factor that prompted me to continue. Because I would ask some question, why am I even bothering to continue with this? Something drove me. And the words of Grandmaster Kim would come through my mind constantly. Kimajase Jumbi, horse dance ready. And I would just find myself, which is how we started every single class. And I would just do it, do whatever I could do. And very, very small steps. But after eight and a half years, you know, I can do a little bit, and I'm pretty comfortable at this age of my life considering what has happened. Mm. Absolutely incredible. Now, you mentioned a couple movies, movies that motivated you to explore the martial arts, Billy Jack and Enter the Dragon, two movies that we've talked about on this show quite a bit. I mean, personal favorites of mine as well. But do you have a favorite martial arts movie? Um, I would have to say Billy Jack. Was that the first one that you saw? That's a good question. I'm, I'm <laughs> testing a theory here. That's why I'm asking. I think it was, but Enter the Dragon came out shortly thereafter, if I remember right. But that's 45 years ago, Jeremy. You're really pushing me. <laughs> right. Well, if you saw him in theaters, Billy Jack did come out first. If I'm getting my year, if my, remembering my years right, it's 71 for Billy Jack and 73 for Enter the Dragon. Oh, okay. Um, but I have this theory that the first martial arts movie someone sees always holds a strong place in their heart mm -hmm. that we've had plenty of people on the show who have said, you know, I know it's not the best movie, but five deadly venoms is still one of my favorites. Cause it was the first one I saw. So I was just, I was just huh. curious, you know, yeah, and for Billy me, it's Jack cr was cool. kid. Well, yeah, I still movie. like, well, yeah. without a doubt. Certainly, um, you know, and for for the people behind that movie to put so much effort into something that was really just kind of starting to happen in the United States. Yes. It says a lot. How about movie actors? Is there a favorite martial arts actor? Well, um, Bong Su Han, who did the character of Billy Jack performing the kicks in the park. Um, was incredible. At the time, I didn't realize it was someone other than Tom Laughlin. I thought it was him, but it was Bong Su Han, and those kicks were just amazing. That's what really caught my attention. And then, of course, Bruce Lee and all the things that he did, which, again, were beyond description. Chuck Norris was a big favorite years ago. I think I've seen every one of his movies uh, in the 70s that he produced or starred in either one. Um, I liked when he had the octagon and Bill Wallace was in that one. Or no, a force mm -hmm. of one was Bill Wallace. The right. octagon had uh, Tadashi Yamashita, I think, was one of the, the uh, antagonists in that movie. So that genre in that period, which is really not very long, it was probably about seven, eight years stretch. There were so many of them that were good. Killer Elite, I liked with James Caan. Uh, there were some great movies, and to this day, I haven't seen too many that compare. I would agree. For movies that really capture the martial spirit, yes. especially the, the martial spirit from that era, I was fortunate enough. I feel like I started at the end of that era, so I've got a, a glimpse into what it looked like. Um, today's movies and today's martial arts landscape are certainly very different. Yes. I wish we could so, have seen Game of Death to its full culmination. Mm. That would have been a, yeah, an awesome movie. I really would have enjoyed that. The, you know how they tried to doctor it up a little bit. But the parts of Jabbar and uh, Bruce Lee sparring in the original, that's some good stuff. It's a lot of, a lot of fun to watch. Yeah. Uh, two people that contrast so much mm -hmm. in, in a fight because... You know, the, the hypothetical fights between big people and small people are, are something that martial artists debate and continue to debate and probably always will. 
So there we have kind of two extremes, a very, very tall man and someone who is very much not tall. Yeah. So, of course, we have your book, which we're going to talk about a little bit more in in a couple minutes. But are there any other books that from the martial arts realm that you enjoy? Yes, there are. There was a publisher by the name of O'Hara that was public. They would uh, advertise, I should say, in Black Belt and Official Karate. But I bought books by Richard Chun, who was a Taekwondo practitioner. Uh, One on Breaking, that is my favorite, by um, martial artist uh, Taekwondo again, called Pugil Guan, um, called The Art of Breaking. I did read Tadashi Amashita's Shito Ryu book. I like that one quite a bit. Uh, I'm probably forgetting some. I've read a couple from Chuck Norris. I used to read everything I possibly could uh, about martial artists and uh, karate, taekwondo in particular, because I just found them to be incredibly amazing arts and the kicking and then having the strength to break large quantities of boards or bricks. That really appealed to me. Mm. You've mentioned breaking a few times, and it's not something that we talk about much on the show. Was there a, a favorite uh, breaking technique that you used, or you know, just just kind of clue us into to breaking for for you? Yes, I began like most students do, breaking a one inch board, and that seemed pretty daunting at the time. And I was probably a green belt or a blue belt when I started to do that. And as I progressed toward first to be black belt, I got it up to five boards with a stepping side kick or what Master Kim would call a reverse back side kick. And that was pretty much fun because whenever I'd see the demonstrations where the masters, the Korean masters, would um, be displaying their skills much more proficiently than I could, they would be breaking five boards. So I knew I had at least as much power, even though their technique was that much more crisp. It was really, really well defined. Mine wasn't. I was relied more on power to do it. And then eventually, uh, there's a Korean term called chun kwan, which is a four fist or a hammer fist. And I would use that rather than a knife hand to break concrete blocks. And I used to break three, uh, two inch by eight inch by 16 inch concrete blocks. And I would practice, um, on the front yard of our house, we had concrete where the water would come down and in the walls of our basement, which was solid concrete. And I would use that to condition my hands to develop callus. So I did that all the time to build up more and more resistance to the force, not hurting my hand. And my hands are just fine today. But uh, (laughs) that was my favorite technique, that hammer fist. And that thing was pretty strong to break those concrete blocks. Yeah. Block, what am I saying? Concrete uh, blocks or bricks with tiny spacers. And I don't think I even needed the spacers. Master Kim just didn't want us to break our hands, but my hands were so calloused from the training that I just thought that was a great thing. And it just shows how mind over matter can be accomplish as you said before we find a way to do things that we really want to do i couldn't have conceived of that as a white belt that would never right. cross my mind but sure enough it happened you know there, there's a wonderful element to the breaking world and, and i have some friends that are very deep into it and have some some competition and some world records and things and i i've dabbled a little bit but the fun thing about breaking is that it's objective mm-hmm. you know assuming that you're not cheating with your materials which you know you know if you are right then you know if you break it you broke it and you know you can't can't really argue the success or the failure there yeah i broke my leg once too doing it <laughs> <laughs> how did you do that at age 49 i thought i'd go back and enter a tournament and um uh, sparring and doing the forms, Korean young, I got a third place in each. And in the breaking part, it was supposed to be one board 
and you could have up to three stations, which I thought was pretty simple, being a second-degree black belt. Uh, so I decided to do them all in one. Uh, I actually went for four, as I recall. And I did a stepping side kick, but unfortunately, I had forgotten how important it is to have good holders and experienced holders. And I had two yellow belts with small hands. They were not very tall. And I hit the boards okay, but I think the guys moved a little bit. And my ankle did with it, so I broke my ankle <laughs> just above oh. the bone. And, of course, anyone that has spent any time breaking knows the importance of good holders. And I think yeah. we all have a story of flubbing a break from from holders moving. <laughs> yeah. And Mr. Kim was so good at teaching us how to do that, how to hold correctly. And I had forgotten when I tried this at age 49, 12 years ago, uh, how to do it the correct way and then how to have the holders and have everything positioned properly. So when you execute the technique, even though my technique was not as good at age 49 as it was at 20, obviously, um, it was good enough, but I didn't work with the holders. And that was my mistake. And I paid the price. (laughs) (laughs) Hopefully you weren't out of commission for too long. No, about six weeks, and there's nothing you can do for a broken bone like that. It didn't shatter all the way through, but it was a clear break in the bone. And I think it was about two months before I was able to get back and start doing things. You know, I was going to ask you, were there times in your um, career, so to speak, with martial arts that you felt a sense of oneness when you were doing, if you're doing Korean or Japanese kata, whatever you do, when you're doing those so well that you know you have hit the best you can be that you are in sync, so to speak, with whatever that internal energy is? Yeah, it hasn't happened really often, but it it absolutely does happen uh, with, you know, whether you want to call them xiong or tol, pomse, kata, you know, forms, patterns. Yes. Uh, that has always been my... Um, my strength, the place where I feel the strongest in my martial arts. And it's an incredible feeling. Mm -hmm. You know, again, I think it goes back to, you know, when we talk about finding the thing in your life that you can do better than anyone else, I'm absolutely not saying that I can do forms better than everyone or even anyone. But for me, within my martial arts training and expression forms is the the element that i feel the strongest in practicing well congratulations they're not easy to do and they were not my strong point they were my weak part but every now and then as you said i would for some reason on a given day it would fall in place and when you do that two or three times the same form i would come away saying boy i really feel at ease i'm relaxed yet i'm uh, highly focused on what I'm doing, and I felt that oneness was some kind of a, an energy force, for lack of a better term, whether it comes from within or without, I was connected to it. Very rare, but a wonderful feeling. Sure, sure, an incredible feeling, and, and one that, um, if we could package it up as a drug, I'm sure a lot <laughs> yeah. of people would get addicted. <laughs> That's very true. I never felt more peaceful those few times that happened because forms were really hard for me, the precision, and to do them properly and to always have the the, uh, return to where your stance began and when it's going to end. I had to work at that. That was hard. Breaking came relatively easy. Sparring, I was so-so. 50-50. Bill Wallace would have me done in about 20 seconds. (laughs) But uh, the forms part, I admired the Koreans so much because they were just uh, machines. They were so good. And uh, I wasn't. So every now and then when I have a really good one, it was a great feeling. Awesome. So let's talk more about you and your book and and these other things going on. This is kind of your commercial time, so I'll I'll turn it over to you. And share with us what, what you want to share about the book. And I'd love to know, you know, why you wanted to write the book. But other than that, no, have at it. Well, the incident occurred almost eight and a half years ago. And when I got to the seven year point, I came to this realization. And I have a photographic memory, so I remember these. 
uh, chronological sequential events very well. But it occurred to me that the reason I survived and the reason that I still continued with my rehab, even though I could do very little, and it was very hard, the little I could do, was in March of 2015 when I began to see that my body was returning back to normal and I could walk normally and I could perform uh, hand movements. Kicks were still hard, but I could do some of the things I used to do. And in the process of that seven-year period of doing these little baby steps to kind of start to get back into the flow. I was 60 years old at that point, so I'm nowhere near what I used to be. And because of the injury, that was a further inhibition. Uh, I just, it dawned on me one day that, you know, what has kept me going to do this to the point where now I can look in the mirror and I feel pretty good about who I've become because I couldn't say that seven years earlier when the injury had occurred. And I would relate that to the indomitable spirit. That thought just came to mind. What kept me going? Because I wondered. I just couldn't understand for seven years why I'd have the desire to still keep trying because it would have been so easy to just quit. And most people do. The vast majority, 25% of those people who are lucky enough to survive the one in a million that we talked about die in three years and they just kind of give up. So it just occurred to me that that tenet of indomitable spirit is what kept me going, but I wasn't really aware of it at a conscious level. And at that point, once I realized that I thought, you know, there's a story here and what it will hopefully bring is hope and inspiration to other people who have had injuries or illness and as I began to go back and forth with the publisher, we looked at any type of circumstance or life difficulty. could be personal or financial or job or career or the loss of a loved one or a relationship. It really doesn't make any difference. The process is always the same. You get knocked on your butt and then you have to get up even if it takes you a little while to get up. And you keep moving forward and you keep progressing. So while your physical body may not be able to do that, which it could, in my case, 40 years earlier, that inner strength gets stronger. The body may not be as receptive to what you want it to do, but the internal spirit is absolutely receptive to it. And then I wrote the book and... I won't say it's gone completely viral, but it's available all over the world now. And more important, this story has been told by NBC TV during a live interview. I've done, done a number of radio interviews, a number of book signings, some at my former uh, Dojang when they had promotion tests. And uh, it's getting a lot of visibility and publicity. And most people who comment to me or book review companies who will give me unsolicited comments say this is an inspirational book everyone who has a problem or think they may someday should read this book take from it their concept and apply it in their own lives and that's the biggest gratification that I can receive it isn't financial it's just having people say I read your book I got one yesterday from a guy in Tampa Florida who I've never met. And he said, I really feel the urge to continue. He had the same injury and he survived. He's a little tougher than I was, or tougher situation, I should say. But he's coming up to visit me in uh, August from Tampa, Florida, so we can meet because there are very few survivors. Wow. Yeah, I think for me, the, the piece in your story that is most striking is that to anyone on the outside, you know, whether I'm sure the, the doctors, the nurses, anybody in the hospital, anybody that had any experience with this condition, I'm sure mentally wrote you off. They all did. Just the, the numbers were so stacked against you. That name of the book, Miracle Man, that was not a name that I gave. That was what the nurses gave me because no one thought I would survive. And they told my so he, wife that when the surgery was going on, I was sedated and going through the procedure, but she's preparing for me to be dead 
And uh, that didn't happen. And so, of course, for me, you know, I'm, I'm someone that really responds strongly to the motivational stories of others, you know, your story and, and certain plenty of others. And so I look at this and I, for me, I say, if you can make it through that, you know, what this, this challenge that I'm facing right now that is not statistical certain death pale so far in comparison if you can make through that i can make it through this Mm -hmm. and that's fire for me like that really gets me going and that is the most gratifying thing in the world jeremy to hear someone say that because there are some really tough stories as you know and you've heard so when you hear someone come back and say i'm going to get up tomorrow or today and i'm going to go do something small as it may be but if it's on a larger path Boy, I feel good. That's a great feeling. Yeah. Yeah. And I personally, I applaud you for your willingness to share something so personal. So uh, what I I can only imagine is still very sensitive. I mean, I've talked to other people who have had circumstances where they've been close to the end of their life and come back. And it's, um, you know, it's an emotional experience to be sure. So. Uh, I, I think it says a lot about your character that you're willing to open up and to share all that, not just on a book, but here on the show. And I appreciate it. Well, you're more than welcome. And I can tell you've done this a lot. You're a very professional interviewer. And one of the things that I think is unique about the book, and I wanted this by design because you and I both know in martial arts, there's no in between. It's either yes or no. I include those surgical records and the hospital records and I identify the hospital. So anyone can look at that book and say, this is not some made-up story, this really happened, because I don't know the verbiage very well in those records, although I've uh, learned how to understand some of them. It's medical lexicon, and anyone can look at that and say, yeah, it's all there in black and white. My name is clearly identified, what, where, when. And um, the point in saying that is it's authentic, it's documented, it's a true story and relate it back to one thing, the martial arts training. That's how you overcome severe problems because we're going to face them whether we like it or not. And they're going to manifest in many forms. Health is just one of them. But as we go through life, it is difficult, but so is getting up off the mat when you've got a broken leg or you've broken something a board or a brick, and you've broken your hand. That's not easy either, but it's the same process. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate you being here today. Uh, Any parting words of wisdom? You've certainly left us with some pretty powerful things and uh, some pretty poignant quotes, but anything to tie it off? I think... uh... The one thing I would say, and I'm hearing you saying the same thing, is that development of the internal self, the internal strength, qi, or the Chinese call qi, either same thing, that is the single most part of a human person's uh, being, so to speak, that if they develop that sense of inner strength, that transcends their entire lives. And I don't know of any other activity that will grant that uh, other than martial arts training. Thank you for listening to episode 92 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. And thank you to Subbanum Pribble. Head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for links to Subbanum's book and pictures that showcase how strongly he's come back from statistically certain death. If you like the show, make sure you're subscribing or using one of our free apps. They're available on both iOS and Android. For those of you kind enough to leave us a review, remember we randomly check out the different podcast review sites, and if we find your review and mention it on the air, be sure to email us for your free box of Whistlekick stuff. If you haven't left us a review yet, please do help us out and leave one. Those reviews are a lot more important than you think. If you know someone that would be a great interview for the show, please fill out the form at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, or if you want to shoot us a message with a suggestion for a Thursday show or some other feedback, there's a place to do that too. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram, pretty much everywhere you can think of. And our username is always Whistlekick. And remember the products you can find at Whistlekick.com or on Amazon, like our great line of hats. If you're a school owner or a team coach, 
you should check out wholesale.whistlekick.com for our discounted wholesale program. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Now remember, you only have until June 20th to register for the Martial Arts Weekend at martialartsweekend.com. Lots of incredible instructors on tap, and there's a ton of buzz about the event. Don't miss out. It's easily the best value you'll find in a weekend trading. martialartsweekend.com. Be there.